What is up, everybody? It is your boy, MPB, back here with another video for the WMU Football Dynasty. Last episode, I introduced you all to the series concept and gave you the inside scoop on all the settings, sliders, and coach adjustments. But this week is the week that we lay our foundation for the 2021 to 2022 college football season. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the preseason. So first things first, let's dive straight into this roster. No more beating around the bush. In terms of overall ratings, the top player for the Western Michigan Broncos entering the season is Ali Fayad. Checking in at number one, both in overall rating and jersey number. Checking in at 6'2", 250. His size certainly isn't going to blow you out of the water coming off the edge, but his presence will be felt. During the 2021 through 2022 season, Fayad led the Broncos with 13 sacks. Fayad actually originally opted to declare for the NFL draft following last season, before returning thanks to the extended deadline for draft decisions. It is a decision that proved worthwhile as he tormented opposing quarterbacks all season. While the 68 speed isn't great, his 88 acceleration, 86 awareness, 81 tackle, 81 power move, and 78 finesse moves are nothing to sneeze at, not to mention his 85 block shedding and 81 hit power. I think it's safe to say that Fayad will be a star for our defensive front this year, and we should enjoy him while it lasts as he is a redshirt senior. Fellow redshirt senior Mike Caliendo checks in at the second highest overall on this WMU Bronco team. He's a center slash guard hybrid who's been an anchor in the interior for the Broncos. Caliendo's going to be a breath of fresh air in the middle, providing stability and strength at the center spot. His 86 awareness, 91 strength, along with his 84 blocking attributes are going to be essential in getting anything at all going on offense. Next up, we absolutely have to talk about the dynamic Sky Moore. He is by far our biggest Swiss Army knife. We'll be using him in the return game as our number one receiver and even out of the backfield sometimes. He is the fastest player on our entire active roster, both in terms of the actual speed rating and in terms of acceleration. I'm going to predict that Sky Moore is going to be a fan favorite here in Season 1. But if you missed the introduction video by any chance, first of all, go give that a watch. And secondly, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different in this dynasty. Because this is taking place in a weird lull between the actual college football seasons. I'm going to be playing out the 2021 through 2022 regular season with the roster that won eight games in their second ever bowl game. But I will treat it with realism as I pivot to my own side of the dynasty. And I will do that by cutting Sky Moore and our quarterback, who I'll get to in a minute, following this season since both players are actually declaring for the NFL draft in real life. So that will present an interesting challenge as we can't rely on our number one quarterback and number one receiver next year. And we'll just have to enjoy them for this one season. Outside of his electric speed, Sky Moore provides all right enough catching at 79. Trust me, in using him a little bit, he's already dropped some long bombs. So you can expect that in this series. But as you can see, he's got only decent receiver attributes outside of his actual elusiveness. And he would make a terrific running back if his carrying was a little bit higher. Think of him as Debo Samuel-esque in the way that we will utilize him in our offense. In the real-life 2021 season, Sky Moore led all Broncos with 94 catches, 1,292 yards, and 10 touchdowns, four of which came in a single game in the regular season finale against NIU, the eventual MAC champions. I would be ecstatic we can match those numbers in any way, but we're mainly just going to be reliant upon him for those big plays and those chunk yards in clutch situations. Next up, we've got another member of the defensive line, Ralph Hawley, who checked in with six sacks himself in the 2021 season. An even more physical presence inside with 87 strength. This is another big dude that I would not personally want to be tackled by. The man's certainly not the quickest. But he's agile, he accelerates well, he's got good awareness, and strength and power moves checking in at 87 overall apiece is music to my ears in terms of a defensive tackle. That 81 overall block shedding is going to ensure he gets into the backfield often, and that 87 hit power might jolt a couple of balls loose. Very excited about the potential of this defensive line. The first player of the bunch that we know we're going to be seeing around next year is Dorian Jackson, the Broncos' number one corner. Led the Broncos in 2021 with two interceptions. 
He definitely doesn't have that downfield speed, but he's got decent acceleration. And his man and zone coverage at 88 apiece is awesome to look at. 88 press, 83 play recognition, and 88 pursuit are also amazing. And 81 tackle makes me think that he could be a safety. But I'm very excited to have him locking down receivers for the next two seasons. And look out for his senior year. He may be pushing 90 at that point. The next face you're going to want to get familiar with is that of Sean Tyler, number 9, running back 1A in the Western Michigan option attack. He's the speedier of our two running backs, checking in with the second high speed rating on the roster, if I'm not mistaken, at 89 overall. His 92 acceleration and 92 agility ensures that he will probably be number two in terms of big plays this season for the Broncos. You'd like to see his break tackle a little bit higher than 70, but his carrying is awesome and his elusiveness and ball carrier vision could be a lot worse at 84 and 83 respectively. 70 catching out of the backfield will get the job done and his 82 spin and juke move will only add to his explosiveness. Over the course of the 2021 season, Sean Tyler put up 1,150 yards on 6.5 yards per attempt, along with 9 touchdowns, 15 receptions, 123 yards receiving, and 2 more touchdowns, for a total of about 1,300 yards from scrimmage and 11 touchdowns. Very excited to see what he develops into over the next 2 years. Next up, we have Zaire Barnes, number 3, checking in at an 83 overall. He's actually from Mundelein, Illinois, very close to where my high school was. In 2021, Zaire was a co-leader in tackles with 68, including 7 for a loss and 2.5 and sacks to go along with that. Some of his attributes leave a little bit to be desired, but his speed isn't terrible. His acceleration and agility are quite nice, and his tackle and fundamental defensive attributes are slightly above average including very good coverage skills for a linebacker. But his 89 finesse moves is where he's going to make his bread and butter. Look for him to make his presence felt as well. And a bittersweet prospect in the form of Caleb Ellaby is up next. He is a quarterback whose real-life potential I am very high on. A quarterback that got thrown into the fire over three years ago when longtime starter John Wassink went down for the season. Ellaby came in and showed off his raw talent immediately making the eventual decision to hand the reins over to him very easy. LB's numbers really popped off the stat sheet in a COVID-shortened season, where he threw for 1,700 yards in six games, along with 18 touchdowns to only two interceptions, checking in at an 195 quarterback rating for the season. And while he didn't take the explosive step that many thought he could take in 2021, he still steered the Broncos to an eight-win season, all the while flashing his raw ability. With 3,277 passing yards and a completion percentage of about 64%, accompanied by 23 touchdowns and 6 interceptions for a quarterback rating of 156.8. Ellaby is a prospect that I think would be the perfect fit with one more year in the system, but as I alluded to earlier, he is going to be a tragic cut in the preseason next year, as I'm doing my best to stick to the realism and have Caleb Ellaby enter the NFL draft just as he is doing in real life. But as I show you his overall ratings, you can see why I'm sorry to let him go. With 79 speed and 88 acceleration, which is more than enough to be a dual threat in the option and play action pass game, 88 agility and 78 elusiveness makes it hard for defenders to bring him down. And while his throwing attributes are not too flashy at 85 throw power and 78 throw accuracy, which by the way, I think is a little bit low, his poise in the pocket and knack for big plays is plenty for him to be the comfortable starter for this season unless something goes horribly awry. And once more, it will be sad to let him go at the end of the season. I'll run through a couple more notable players really quickly, including Corvin Moment, a senior and our middle linebacker, with 86 acceleration, 81 awareness, and 79 tackle. Nothing pops off the page except for his 90 hit power, but he will certainly get the job done this season. On the right side of the offensive line, we've got Dylan Deathridge, one of the best names in college football, who will be holding it down with 91 strength, 82 pass and run block, as well as 82 impact blocking. The other half of the running back committee is Ladarius Jefferson, the 2021 leader for touchdowns on the ground for the Broncos. Jefferson totaled 874 yards from scrimmage and 10 touchdowns. He is definitely the power back, the sledgehammer at the goal line, if you will. Despite having 93 acceleration, he only clocks in at 71 speed. 
but he makes up for it with decent break tackle and some above average running back traits. This is definitely an example of a guy that feels a lot better in game than his ratings might look. Rounding out the weapons on offense, we have Corey Crooms. He is definitely going to be the number two option on all pass plays. Another guy that plays a lot better than his ratings might suggest. He does provide much needed speed at 86 speed and 91 acceleration. His 74 and above receiving traits are all awesome as well. You'd like if his jumping was a little bit higher, but beggars can't be choosers. I will tell you right now that Corey Crooms will benefit a lot from Sky Moore getting attention on defense. Crooms was able to snag 44 catches for 768 yards and 6 touchdowns in 2021, trailing only Sky Moore in yards and touchdowns. Despite him being lower here on the wide receiver chart in terms of overall, he will definitely be the number 2 receiver. He reeled in 4 times as many catches as Nunley during the regular season, so there's no real competition there. And I also think that it's very important to mention that Jalen Hall, a dynamic receiving threat for the Broncos, was second on the squad in terms of receptions for 2021, checking in with 46 grabs for 752 yards and three touchdowns himself. I really liked Jalen Hall as a prospect. He's a very exciting playmaker. But last we've heard, he's entered the transfer portal and is heading to Western Kentucky. Best of luck to him, but he is nowhere to be found on this roster, and I don't see him on the Hilltoppers either. But that is all water under the bridge. Before I show you the final depth chart, I am going to be going through and taking care of all these red shirts. I'll try my best to fly through these. I am not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Marian Probowski looks like an interesting talent at the quarterback position. With 80 speed, 90 agility, and 90 acceleration, he could be very exciting for the option game down the road. That is, if we do not replace him on the recruiting path. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and slap on that red shirt label for him and keep trying to fly through these. Zaheer here looks like a good talent as a true freshman, but he's not going to see the field, so he'll be a red shirt for sure. At the receiver position, we got another true freshman, Henry Wilson, who's not going to be seeing the field very much. In fact, all three of these can be red shirted. What are we looking at then, numbers wise? We got one, two, three, uh, four, five on the roster at that point. But you know what? We're going to roll with it. We'll take the punches. Caden Morris, buddy, I'm sorry. You're not seeing the field. You're getting red shirted as well. We can do that with all of these linemen. Ooh, I'm going to like that depth at the left tackle position. A 71 getting redshirted. He will be an anchor moving forward. Brandon Honorable with an incredible name looking to be the future at the left tackle position. We're going to go ahead and redshirt Dalton over here as well as Elijah Hawk. Joshua Nobles, you could take a redshirt. Corey Walker, you could take a redshirt. Tyson Lee can play as a true freshman because we're going to need that depth at the right end position. The tackle is all good. Same here, we're gonna need Zach Vogt just for depth, but uh, Bryant here is gonna get redshirted for sure. No other position on defense actually even had redshirt eligible players outside of strong safety here. We will not be redshirting a 79 overall senior though, unfortunately. That kicker situation is not looking too great. What is that kick power? I thought that was kick power for a second and that would not have been ideal. We're going to add 86 and 64 kick accuracy. Wow. That is breaking news to me, everybody. I'm not going to lie. I had not looked at that. That is a major development. I have never seen, personally, a senior kicker with an accuracy rating that low. Wow, that terrifies me. Okay, noted. So next up is the depth chart, and I'm going to keep it pretty straight up with this one. Since we're replicating 2021 and trying to branch off from there, the roster will pretty much be a carbon copy of the 2021 Broncos in terms of usage. Something I plan on doing that I really look forward to is having practices at the beginning of every season during this allotted preseason time so that I can host open position competitions, walk you all through some immersive storylines, and establish our identity year after year. So that's something I really want to do long term. But again, I expect this year to be pretty straightforward. So barring any major injuries, this team will look pretty dang similar to the team that won the second bowl game in program history this past season. Because we're redshirting that freshman quarterback, our third spot on the depth chart looks pretty bare bones. I think I'm honestly going to go ahead and put in Sky Moore there because let's face it, if we get to that point, we are solely running an option attack and Sky Moore will be the main weapon there. 
Tyler and Jefferson again will be in a timeshare for the duration of the season, listed as one and two respectively. At fullback, we're going to have Jack Sherwin, number 36, a sophomore. Now, the game actually has him as our highest rated tight end, but he hasn't even seen the field at Western. He's even listed as an offensive lineman, actually, right now. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone, just slot him in at fullback. Which brings us to our big guy at tight end, Brett Borski at 6'7. Funnily enough, in an old dynasty of mine, he was a freshman or sophomore on the squad and I developed him into an all-American tight end in a couple years. I think it's safe to say he didn't live up to that expectation based off his 75 overall, but he should get the job done for sure. Over to receivers, we got Sky Moore at the number one, of course, and Corey Crooms, as I mentioned earlier, at the number two. Bryce Nunley and Anthony Sambucci will be checking in at the three and four, respectively. But we got Kavion Mack and Jackson Kincaid as depth receivers. Kincaid coming over from the running back room. Offensive line is what it is. The defensive line, definitely the strength of this defense. I didn't even get to Andre Carter in my rundown of key players, but he as a junior at 6'5 and 245 will be eating up a lot of blocks himself opposite Fayad. Tyson Lee will get a rotational role as a backup right end behind Fayad. Ralph Holly Jr. and Braden Fisk will be clogging up the interior as well. With slim pickings behind them, definitely going to have to beef that up over time. Zaire Barnes, who we already talked about, is in there at the left outside linebacker position. Corvin Moment, another awesome name who we also talked about earlier, fills out that middle linebacker spot. And then we got Ryan Seelig, definitely another position we want to upgrade long term there. And then the corner breakdown looks like this. Dorian Jackson, the junior we talked about earlier with a bright future. We've got Deshaun Bustle, the former wide receiver at the number two corner spot. I have played basketball with him at least once at the WMU Rec Center myself. He definitely felt faster than an 85 speed, but that just tells you what kind of otherworldly speed you need to be a Division I athlete. Coleman and Lovely fill out the three and four corner spots. We got a lot of juniors and seniors here and some low overalls. So corner definitely gets added to the list of things we need to address long term. We've got an 80 and a 75, both seniors at free safety. And next we've got number six, AJ Thomas, another senior who's a very versatile player, plays a kind of hybrid safety linebacker position for the Broncos. He's got wear breathing down his neck as a 79 overall. Both seniors. Hopefully we'll find a way to get wear on the field a little bit more. Actually, we'll do that right now by just swapping him in as a backup in this situation. And then again, we've got our kicker, 74 overall with 64 accuracy. Still can't get over that. And our punter who will be holding it down. Again, both seniors. Going to need to replace those. Sky Moore checking in with a 99 overall as a kick returner. No questions about him being the guy, both in the kickoff game and the punt game we need to get the ball in his hands as many times as possible nick mahalik will get the job done kicking off while kyle Leander remains the long snapper okay now, in the real-life 2021 season, the Western Michigan Broncos did open the season at Michigan, losing that game 47-14, to but we're not going to talk about that just yet. The Broncos then took on FCS Illinois State in their home opener. But as you all know from the introduction, we're trying to make this a challenge, so we will not put in that tune-up game against an FCS squad. The 2021 Broncos then traveled to Heinz Field in Pittsburgh to take on the Pitt Panthers. Unfortunately, Pittsburgh was not available to play in week two, so we had to slot them in at week three. But we ended up just flip-flopping with San Jose State, who the Broncos then hosted after stunning Pittsburgh. From that point on, the schedule is completely randomized with MAC opponents. Road games against Michigan and Pittsburgh, of course, are holding up our strength of schedule, but we still clock in at a measly C-. This is a trait that I know will be massively improved over time especially once we get that big conference money. But for now, our eyes are set on this max schedule. With our two biggest rivals by far, Eastern Michigan and Central Michigan, back-to-back -back weeks. Looks like we're going to be in Mount Pleasant, Michigan for the Broncos Chips game, while hosting the Eagles. Beyond our bitter rivals, though, we can't take any team in this conference lightly. But once again, that's the schedule we're looking at. Michigan and Pittsburgh would be two huge wins if we can get them. But I'm certainly not getting my hopes up, especially for that big house game. Very excited for that matchup, though. And by my estimation, there is only one thing left to do, which would be to set up that recruiting board. Okay. 
Something I really want to emphasize here real quick is that I want this to be a collaborative series. I want you all to get as involved as you possibly want to. And in my eyes, part of that means giving me custom recruits to throw into the world, to throw into the universe so we can follow their stories. I'd love some good backgrounds. I'd love some interesting prospects with skills that perhaps stand out compared to other recruits. Unfortunately, I want to jump straight into the season and start giving you guys content as soon as possible. And for that very reason, I will not be taking input in recruiting classes until next recruiting cycle. But please keep that in mind and start developing those plot lines so we can add another dynamic to this already exciting dynasty. Alright, and without further ado, we are into the recruiting menu. And one of my favorite things to always check out at the beginning is my school and how we're doing in all of these ratings. As you can see, it is an uphill battle for just about everything. Academic prestige is increased by targeting prospects that don't have to wait too long to be a starter on your team. Coach prestige, of course, comes with winning more. Conference prestige comes from the conference having high-ranking members. Championship contender always stems down to your championship outlook and your projected rankings over the next four years. Pro potential directly correlates with draft picks from your program. The more you start pumping out, the higher your grade will get. Coach stability comes from just a long stay at a respective school. Program tradition is all about winning the big ones. Winning bowl games, winning conference championships, and winning the national championship are all excellent ways to increase your program tradition. Television exposure, of course, comes from a bigger conference and a more prestigious school. And the more you win on national televised games, the better your television exposure and the more you're going to have. Here's the stadium atmosphere. As you can see right now, the average attendance at Waldo Stadium, the home of the Broncos, is about 18,000 people when the max capacity is 30,000 people. Of course, we want to get good enough that we're selling out every single game. The more home wins you have, the longer win streaks, and the more your prestige and attendance grow, the higher your stadium atmosphere grade goes. Campus lifestyle is improved by performing well in all areas, but certain locations have actual edges. For example, Hawaii. You'd think that campus lifestyle is pretty awesome, and it seems that way. Western Michigan's not so much. Another nice little menu right here is the team needs menu. Shows you what you're looking at in terms of trajectory with the classes of each of your players. Who's leaving, who will be around for a little bit longer, and so on. This is what it looks like on offense, and this is what it looks like on defense. Now remember, this isn't exactly accurate to our situation, as Sky Moore and Caleb LB are supposed to be around next year. And the computer is taking them into account in terms of depth. So quarterback is actually definitely going to need to be a priority as well as receiver just to fill that void that's going to be there once Sky Moore departs. So with that, it's time to go into what has become my tradition in the dynasty, which is to just look at all prospects in general, sort them by their caliber, at least to begin with, and see who, if anybody in the top 100 has any kind of interest in Western. If they do, I'm going to throw them onto my list immediately as we see Chris Jackson. Not to be mistaken with Tony Ward winning Chris Jackson, who strangely looks very similar to this man. Chris Jackson has a beginning overall of 75, but we're going to have to scout him. And that's only going to happen by adding him to our list. In terms of how much I'm going to be showing this week in and week out, I think it's going to vary. I'll probably give you an update at least every other week. But of course, I will announce any other exciting developments throughout the season. Outside of Chris Jackson, we're not having a ton of luck with these high caliber recruits at the moment. Ah, and just as I say that, we have stumbled upon Philip Brown from Brookfield, Wisconsin. Going to definitely add him as well. Another receiver. He's a four-star. And wow, I'm already at 379 plus. I think I'm just going to go mining and I will come back with any updates. I won't have to come back for a second. I'll just show you right now. Brian Green, a 66 overall middle linebacker, or so they say, from Greenwood, Indiana. Decent prospect. We'll make sure to scout him up later. We're going to add another receiver in Kurt Stevens, 65 overall out of Moline, Illinois. Just a little bit further down the list, we've got John Mosley, a quarterback, a scrambling quarterback at that out of San Bruno, California. Definitely going to check him out as well. Got two prospects real quick here, including Jordan Holly here. Also a D-tackle. I wonder if there's any relation to Ralph Holly Jr., our stud defensive tackle. That could be an interesting storyline. Definitely going to add him to our list at the very least. Then we got Dan Perry, a quarterback out of Plantation, Florida. 
Wow. Derek Williams, a nice looking tight end, will be added onto our list as well. Looks like we're competing with Central and U of M over him. Jeff Barrett at 65 overall is coming in with us as his number one school. Always love to see that. Definitely going to add him to the list as well. Another notable addition to the list here coming in at ranked 1052. Someone seems a little bit better than that is a 67 overall tackle, John Ferguson out of Farmington Hills, Michigan. He's also got us as his number one school. Love to see it. Welcome to the list, John. I've added a couple more guys here and there, but as of now, we have gone through all five through three stars with any kind of interest in Western Michigan. Next up is looking at anybody else with us as a number one school. This is what we got so far. So here are the three stars that we have that are number one interest and two other ones that I added. 68 overall kicker. Um, might need you, buddy. Definitely going to add you at least to check you out. 68 fullback uh, from Juco. You know, I'm just going to add him because sometimes they're weird about uh, eligibility requirements with uh, fullbacks having the right amount. Much rather have a 68 overall than the 45 overall filler player they would give me. So another thing that pops up here in this little search window, which I didn't acknowledge, is the official position needs according to the CPU. Again, sometimes these aren't always accurate, especially when you're recruiting athletes that so you plan to put at a given position. And look at that, right off the bat, we're going to need two fullbacks, so adding that one star might end up being clutch. We're also going to need a punter replaced, a kicker replaced, a new free safety, middle linebacker, a defensive tackle at least, a center, and a guard. That is no joke, especially considering on top of that, we need a new quarterback of the future, as well as some new playmakers on offense. Knowing what we need coming into the season in terms of position depth means we can narrow down our search parameters even more. So now I'm going to look at some quarterback prospects, even if they aren't interested in me, to add to the recruiting board and hopefully win over after some time. It looks like we at least won't repel Vincent O'Donnell. Looks like we've got B-plus for playing style, which is his most important trait. He's a balanced quarterback with a 4.88.40. His speed is projected only a D, though. That would be disappointing. But we'll see what this 6'4", 214-pound quarterback looks like. At the very least, he's going on our board. Paul Sellers, who's got a nice overall. We've got two solid Cs. No C-minuses. And a B-plus for playing style. Another guy that it looks like we won't repel. Oh, Middle Tennessee, Troy, Arkansas State, and Louisiana. Yeah, we are hopping on Paul Sellers. Let's see how this goes. The next search we're going to try out is at pretty much any given position, but this time we're looking at only pipeline states. So that's only states that we have enough players on our roster that we get recruiting bonuses. This also includes Michigan, and this is a really cool little nugget that the game has added to add more realism to recruiting and asserting dominance in certain geographical areas. Jeff Grigsby might be the most interesting prospect that has no interest in us. He has interest in NIU and Central. We definitely need to keep him away from the Chippewas. But on top of that, his most important trait of proximity to home is an A as he is a Holt, Michigan native. But the coach prestige and conference prestige are also not hurting. Looking at the breakdown right now, it'll be a little bit of an uphill climb, but I do not think this is out of our reach by any means, so I'm definitely going to hop into this recruiting battle as well. Charles Walton, similar kind of situation, another four-star out of Michigan. He's getting looks from the Big Ten, it looks like, though, so this might be a little bit tougher to catch up with. That being said, Charles Walton, welcome to our target list. Literally in the backyard of Central Michigan's campus, we find Terrell Burnett. He's a 71 overall projected with a three-star rating. A Michigan native, of course, so a pipeline state. But he could also come in and start right away basically next year. So his playing time is an A+. And the proximity to home and conference prestige both boosts for all those reasons and more. Terrell Burnett is certainly getting added to the recruiting board. How about that? Another linebacker with a similar situation. Out of Benton Harbor, we got Nick Burke, the number 19 ranked run-stopping backer in the country. Another three-star with a 71 projected overall at 6'4 and 228 pounds. I like his size. And clearly, he likes something about us because his proximity to home and playing time radars are clicking and the conference prestige is not hurting. So everybody give Nick Burke a warm welcome to the recruiting board. The second to last spot on our recruiting board for the preseason is going to go to Blake Strong from Decatur, Indiana. Coming in with a 3-star rating of his own and a 70 projected overall. His playing time rating is through the roof and his proximity to home is just a cherry on top. 
please give a hefty welcome to the recruiting board to Blake Strong. I almost backed out of these search parameters entirely, but I stayed strong for just a couple more spots before finding Neil Campbell, who will be our 35th and final member of the preseason recruiting board. Neil is from Plymouth, Michigan, a three-star pass-blocking center with a 70 overall projected. Luckily for us, the playing style, proximity, and playing time all kind of click together for what should be a nice little boost on him weekly. This is a no-brainer with Caliendo soon to be out the door. Neil Campbell, we will happily let you be the final slot. So let's look at that recruiting board now, shall we? I'll rearrange it real quick. What I like to do is at the beginning of the season start and just rank everyone strictly based off their projected overalls. Of course that changes as we do more scouting, but unfortunately for us, because we're starting at the default coach level, we are only able to scout each player 25% each week. But for now, let me rearrange the rankings to reflect raw overalls and use all the scouting points available to me to try to windle down a little bit. So I will see you on the other side of that. Alright y'all, welcome back. I've got it sorted in the order that I'd like. Chris Jackson, who we hope to be our knight in shining armor, is an easy number one. With Charles Walton, the four star, also out of Michigan, Darnell Sims, Terrell Burnett, Nick Burke, Jeff Grigsby, Neil Campbell, Blake Strong, Sean Joseph, and Dan Perry all rounding out the top 10. Let's go ahead and just scout right away. We don't find out much about Chris Jackson in that first go of scouting. Besides, he cannot break very many tackles. His juke and elusiveness are definitely not game changers. But these could each develop nicely. Charles Walton takes a slight bump in the first round of scouting with acceleration and hit power. And man coverage of 79. Charles Walton's already looking like a fantastic prospect. But a lot can change with the rest of the scouting. For now though, we are actually going to go ahead and move Charles Walton up to the number one ranking on our board. Darnell Sims got some hit power and some block shedding for safety. Acceleration 85 is not bad and jumping up to an 81. Terrell Burnett's got good play rec as well as good zone coverage for a middle linebacker. That's 75 stamina, something we can work with as well. Nick Burke's looking solid. Nothing too much to call home about except it's a nice rating of 80 for stamina. That pursuit at 73 definitely ain't bad as well for coming out of high school. Jeff Grigsby is a blazer. He's got 94 speed, which would be the highest speed rating on our entire roster right now. His acceleration is an 84. Wish I was a little bit higher, but he's still a very interesting player. 76 elusiveness, 83 injury, 71 ball carrier vision. Break tackle isn't great, but this guy is a weapon, it looks like. His overall actually goes down three. Didn't realize that with the break tackle. Definitely still think this is an interesting prospect, especially with that speed. You cannot count that out. Wow, Neil Campbell's got an 80 pass block off the get-go and a 77 impact block this looks like the shoe-in perfect starter for caliendo he'd probably start day one at this rate i really want to get in this race blake strong goes up one with 75 power move 75 acceleration 77 stamina sean joseph goes up one 83 speed is not blazing for running back but that 84 agility 82 spin move is something promising for sure wish that carrying was a little bit higher but what you gonna do the first quarterback we are scouting is Dan Perry. Wow. Minus six. He's going to plummet down our board, but he is not coming off of it entirely. Our standards are not that high yet, guys. And what if he has 90 speed? We don't know. Let's hope our luck with scouting QBs is better with this one. Paul Sellers, 71 speed. Not bad, not bad at all. 63 break tackle. Uh, his juke move at 70 is encouraging. That's definitely something to work with. The price is right so far on Rick Price. 88 route running you know i am not a guru in terms of what route running usually comes out of high school but that seems pretty insane for a prospect and his 70 spectacular catch is very intriguing as well especially with projected a for speed this fullback is pretty shifty 80 speed 68 elusiveness 66 strength is not a good indication of a fullback but as i alluded to earlier we actually kind of use our fullback in some instances as a second tight end so this could be really interesting in our system with 
with that 80 speed. Philip Brown checks in with some nice baseline stats. 89 speed would be the second fastest skill player already. So that is always encouraging. 80 jumping and 81 acceleration makes me think he's quite the athlete. 78 injury along with 72 carry is very interesting. We'll have to see how the rest of his ratings pan out. But he could be a running back option long term. We don't find out a whole lot about John Ferguson, the tackle here, except that his strength is not very good, especially for a tackle, but his acceleration is kind of promising. This is the guy that we are number one for. He's a three-star out of Farmington Hills. Still could have some promise. Haven't seen his actual blocking ratings, but the strength is not ideal, that is for sure. Just gave Brian Green a shot. And Mr. Green here's tackling skills are not up to snuff. He could develop into something fine, but I'd like my middle linebacker to have higher than a 67 coming out of high school. Power moves are fine. Zone coverage is not awful. Just not a great prospect. He's definitely going to drop. And the final bit of scouting will go to Derek Williams, the tight end. Let's see what we get out of him. Uh, some strength at 72, okay, his catching, oh, wish that was a little bit better. His release at 62 is not awful. Both of those we can work with, though. Elusiveness and juke move are 70 and 71. We're going to have to see a lot more of his ratings to really know if we're going to want to chase after him. And after the allotted points that we had for scouting, this is what our top 10 looks like. We still got Charles Walton up at number one, the corner, and this is the rest of it. You can look for yourselves and poke around. Um, to the actual scouting process for any of these guys. Some of these guys have some long-term payoff potential, I'll tell you that much. I'm very intrigued with how this recruiting process goes. But all in all, those should actually be the finishing touches on recruiting. One more thing that I might throw in would be the pipeline states. Illinois is actually our biggest pipeline even more than Michigan. I did know just from going to games before and having their programs that Illinois was a massive supplier of WMU football players, but I did not know the number exceeded Michigan's. We'll try to change that around, stay true to the core of Michigan, but definitely keep that Illinois pipeline as well. Indiana's right there at number three, but it looks like we might actually lose that one. And outside of that, it is pretty much our responsibility to build some of our pipelines. It looks like we'll be able to assert that dominance on Michigan as right now we've got 16 targeted players from the state and moving down the road i think wisconsin would be a fantastic pipeline to have I'd love to have ohio just because of the talent that comes out of there but florida tapping into california or texas is always great as well here's a fun little graphic of what it looks like we can actually even look at exactly who we're targeting and from where around the state they are so for context for everybody who's not familiar with the area kalamazoo is just a little bit north of that fair plain area uh, Rochester Hills is the east side, of course. Uh, Mount Pleasant, which we saw earlier, is where Central Michigan is located. So they are pretty dang central. Um, and you'd never believe it, but Eastern Michigan is located on the east side of the state. I'm also seeing now that Chris Jackson, our coveted recruit, is the number two prospect in the state of Michigan. So again, that would be massive for our program if we were able to claim him. And just like that, after quite the lengthy preseason... We are just about ready to simulate into the regular season. I won't show you every single session of me recruiting, but anytime anything remotely interesting happens, you will be shown. We've already gone through the red shirts. We've already gone through the depth chart. We have already set our custom schedule. You know what that means, everybody. It is time to start the season and officially begin the WMU Football Dynasty. Here we go. Regular season, here we come. And Marcus Perez Brennan's tenure as the youngest head coach in the history of Western Michigan University's football program begins now. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Yo, this is kind of groovy though. <laughs>